Okay, the other day I mentioned about phony uh, gear patterning and what I meant was phony gear patterning. And part of where I have been really annoyed with it was in the early days of learning on this stuff, I knew there were pinion depth gauges, but I couldn't ever get the specs for about the first six years of doing gears no one would give me what the correct depth was for any of the axles. Many years later, I finally found for a Dana 60 what the correct number was, so then I could do one by numbers. But previous to that, I was quite aggravated. And as I was looking at the pictures, you have pictures that are from 1925, 1930, been copied 22 different times, the toe, the heel, turned over, using different names. So that's part of why I get annoyed. I also have been annoyed with phony um, phony patterns for gears is because of people that when it's not fitting well they just have put on thicker marking compound and you really don't get a good mark unless it's thin. Now um, in fact, I'll give you a little story on the worst case of that. I had to document on an industrial gear it was about two foot wide. It had a $2 million insurance policy on it not going out. And the gear was off by a 16th inch for alignment over its two foot length. But the people that originally installed it were my bosses and they did not want me to document that it was wrong. So they insisted that I use super thick grease for checking the pattern check it on the coast side instead of the drive side and then sign this in the little book that it was was uh, okay well i took the pattern i wrote down exactly what i did using the grease that was too thick i spelled everything out and i don't think the insurance people were smart enough to read the fact that i was basically saying this is bs but i got away with the fact of saying this is bs i signed it and I actually think that same gear is probably running in industry a 16th of an inch out today. It had already been running for about four years when I had a chance to check it. Okay, back to our uh, ring and pinions here. If we look at this, we can see a real pattern. This is not with paint or anything else. This is a real pattern on a gear. You can see the shiny part there where it's been wearing. Lots of contact area, nice and smooth. This is a used gear I just bought. You can see it on the other side, lots of contact area, nothing missing. That's the way it should look, but it won't look like that when you first put it in. Part of that is it takes a while for them to break in. They have to break in a while before they look like that. That is perfect unless it was a very, very high precision and lined up perfectly, it won't look like that. Now we get over to our markings. This is the same nine inch gear that I was working with the other day and I had taken and I rolled it with the pinion held out on one side and you can see where it made marks on here but it uh, didn't make what would be traditionally called the mark that you're looking for um, any any kind of a real indication this one here we had marks here I got curious and I did something that I'd never done before and I rolled it and scraped it um, without pulling it. I, with these ones I was pushing it forward on the marking while I came along and on these ones I was pulling it backward so that it would be too little of a pinion depth. This one would have been too much, this one would have been too little. This No, this one would have been too much. Anyway. Real interesting thing, this one here, where I was going all the way along here, um, our pinion depth, it's as deep as it can be on this particular pinion, and it stops right here, which I had never noticed before. That is the deepest this pinion will come in there. Doesn't matter what we do for pattern, that's as far as it will go in there, and you can see on the pinion itself that it's going full depth on this particular pinion. So that's something if I'm doing a unknown pinion and uh, ring gear that I will do again is I will actually check before I start putting it together, what is the maximum pattern? And what you don't want, 
say that we are aligning this one, you don't want this straight edge like we've got on the bottom here. When you have that straight edge on the bottom, it means that you are right up to the far end of one of the limits of where your adjustment could go. You really want to have your pattern. Normally, they draw them to be in the middle of the gear. Well, on this one here, it wouldn't be, even if it was perfect, it wouldn't be in the middle of the gear. It would be some kind of a pattern here if it was perfect because we don't even have a pattern that can come down below because the pinion doesn't come there. So that's, that's where that would be. And your pinion depth is generally supposed to be the further in it goes down further, the further out it comes uh, up. So this one here, you can see where I was extremely in that it is hitting down here and it's, it's a sharp line at the bottom, which is not good when I was pulling all the way out. However, um, it's still hitting down here while we're getting some up above. So things don't always pattern perfectly the way that they should. Um, but patterning is good. It will tell you things that you can't see. Some rear ends are very, very um, messed up as far as what you can see there. And the other thing is, again, a lot of the compounds that they give you, and, and you need to understand what's going on too. If you're trying to do a good job, uh, I'm gonna go grab my, some of my good compounds. Okay. I used uh, the white paint on this because I knew that it would show up good there. And using the blue, which is their tr traditional, is a little harder to see with this uh, gear that doesn't have any wear on it. But one of the things, as you notice, the, this is going to be going in this direction. There's a little wiping that goes across the gear. So if you put it on, you want to put on a fairly thin coat of it, and you want to have the brush strokes in a direction across from wherever your gear is so that you can see it make marks. You don't want to be going lengthwise here because you would uh, you might not see where it's wiping it off. And what you want to look for also, some people will say you put that on, and this is something that you'll hear people incorrectly say about this, and you come over here, or, or you put it on the pinion per se and go the other way, and you look at where it transferred to. Well, that's not what you're really looking for. Well, the fact it transferred there as the paint transferred shows you that it's hitting somewhere in here, but it could just be smearing it from one part to the other too. What you look at is you look at the bright areas that are smooth. You look at this area right here is what we would have where it's showing thin, where it's showing bright where you've shown that you've wiped away all of the thickness. Now, problem with this, while this is good stuff, it's got lots of color, it's probably 20 thousandths of an inch thick there. The best I've found is this right here. And they had a bad batch of it for a while, so if you find some old cans and you don't like them, um, just go buy some new stuff. It was actually bad for about a year. And the really old stuff about 30 years ago wasn't too great, but the stuff 20 years ago was real good. And this stuff, which I bought about three years ago is also real good. And it just sprays on a nice visible, maybe one thousandths, half a thousandths inch thick coat. So it gives you a very accurate view of what's going on. And it will just show you where it touched. You don't get the extra smearing from stuff that's too thick. Now, since we're talking about uh, differentials, actually automotive, generally my, I first started on hypoids as what I use them most of the time is in industrial. It just happened that automotive is what I had around here. Um, on this particular Dana 80, which is what that one is, that's the one we already buttoned it up, and they have a extra case saver that goes on each side of it for your outside races. And I'm mentioning that because this is an earlier one and it was real brittle and it cracked. This was actually Rockwell, 
I think the measurement was off because it seemed even crazy at that. It said it was Rockwell 68C, which just seems excessive, but uh, it was cracked. We got some new ones. The new ones from Dana are 40C, which is a good, reasonable, somewhat hard, but not so brittle that it's going to break right away and still uh, case savers there. So that's just a miscellaneous uh, thing. If you're working on Ford 9 inch, as this happens to be, the early ones have got a real small bearing place in the front here. The front pilot bearing is small. And so even though it's supposed to give it extra strength, uh, a lot of times the housing will flex, it'll snap off and you really lose the benefit of the ones that have the small uh, front on them. Or if you have a bad housing where this part and the bearing pocket aren't lined up, you're not gaining anything either. Now, when it comes to making these alignments, uh, your pinion depth. Pinion depth is normally measured off of a end point. And this one here, I'm not really seeing a good machined point. It says 1.027. I don't know if that is supposed to be the depth on this one or not. I couldn't find a standard depth listed for a Ford 9 inch and this is a uh, aftermarket I don't remember the brand um, we brought this in real quick because we needed one to set up some axles we were building for special custom gearboxes and we had ordered the regular Dana uh, Dana brand gears but they hadn't got here yet so we just grabbed this one quickly off of ebay so that we could have something to fill in the space and make sure all the rest of our clearances were okay and so that's why it's still around and it is a six to one so that may be part of why we have such a high ride on the ring gear with the pinion because six to one's fairly low reduction which means a high numeric number Anyway, uh, most of your pinions are measured for a depth that comes off the end or it might be off the end here. Some of them, I noticed that uh, Chrysler tends to want more to measure off the back of where the bearing mounts. And the way you adjust this is with shims in here underneath your uh, tapered bearing, and then you'll have a second tapered bearing. And in between your two bearings, you normally have in this day and age, you used to always have selective shims or spacers. Today they have a crush sleeve. If you're working with one with a crush sleeve, the crush sleeve is the last part you adjust. That's for your, of the pinion adjustment. That's your adjustment for the pinion preload where it tightens up the two bearings. And I really would encourage you for most applications, if you crush one down, take it back apart, use that as a starting point to measure the actual shims Get, get the ones that are solid, if you're using it hard at all. If it's for industry, something you're gonna use hard. Um, because the thing is, when you tighten down, that crush sleeve gives you a somewhat of a place where it stops the nut from moving here, but it doesn't give it something solid that it's tightening against. It can still, from the loads on the pinion, it can actually get pounded to where it um, if this gets to jerking this direction back in towards the ring gear, it will start compressing it more and then this will come loose, which you could then tighten your pinion, but then you're too tight. And so you don't have a solid spacing anymore. Um, real problem that you find with a lot of this is the bearings, getting the bearings on and off while you're doing your trial fits. So you start out with what you think is a correct shim in here. You put your bearing on, it sticks. Now, a common one is that they will use a fitting bearing, which is where you use another bearing, the same as the one you're gonna put on here. But you use, you take it and you, the common way in most mechanic shops is they just take a flapper wheel and flapper wheel out the inside of it so that it is bigger, so it slides on. And, uh, They'll generally tell you they took it to a machine shop and honed it, but everybody I know in a mechanic shop just uses a flapper wheel. We have hones here, I would use a hone because it's nicer. Not because I'm against flapper wheels, they work, they're good enough. The problem with that particular method where you need to watch is bearings are generally the same, but they're not exactly the same. They're doing real good today. If you bought coil bearings and you buy keep buying coil bearings 
and they all haven't made major changes, they'll pretty much be the same and you're going to hit what you want to hit when you put the permanent bearing on there. If you buy Timkins that are fairly late, but if you've got old surplus Timkins from 1930 that you're using, mixing them with something new, they will be different. Not major, they'll only be off by five, maybe seven thousandths. I've never found ones that are off by even ten, but it's enough to throw your shims off from perfect. Good enough? Yes. For most people, yes. Um, what you're also going to find is another little bit of information here. When you go to uh, tighten up your preload on your pinion or a similar short coupled tapered bearing set. And I say that because the thing about short coupled is you're in a housing that's pretty solid. When you tighten those up, you're going to find that somewhere between two and about seven is the maximum thousands past no clearance, past, the, past zero makeup. So what I will do is I will stack on, if I'm not using crush sleeve, I'll stack on too much in here so that this whole assembly is loose. Put an indicator on the end. If this moves back and forth 20 thousandths, then I will take something, depending on what's handy, shims, and I'll go, okay, so I want to take off 20 thousandths. If I can take off 23 is pretty good. 22 will probably give me enough preload. 25 may be too tight, may not. It's going to vary a little bit, but those are some general numbers you can use that start getting you in the ballpark. Most of your carriers, and you find the same thing on industrial gearboxes where they've got a little bit of width between them, they need a little bit more to tighten them up. You're looking at probably 10, 15 thousandths normally for the extra press on your bearings to make them tight. And the same thing, you can take your bearings and flapper wheel or hone out the inside of them so you have test bearings. But you're doing one of these just for yourself, you're doing test bearings, now we just ruined $150 worth of bearings so we could save $300 on doing our rear end. Um, sometimes you want to do your own and you want to do it right. Maybe you're going to do more of them, but it adds to the cost if you're doing that. Um, one of the ways that I do it is I will come in here and instead of doing a test bearing, because what the thing that gets torn up the most uh, if, you're, uh, if you're careful with the bearings, you can put on a uh, pressed on bearing and get it back off a lot of the times, but you got to be really careful. You need to use bearing separators or proper uh, retaining style. We'll show some of them here in a little bit. I got snap on ones over there for the proper pullers for the uh, side gears. I don't, well, the carriers in here in a box, the carrier that I would show that on. We might dig it out. But um, anyway, the thing you do is you put the ones on for the carrier. I'll put them on just tight. Just put the two bearings on there with no shims because on, on a Dana, they put the shims behind them on the carrier. And so what I will do is put them on with no shims at all, put the races in, slide everything in here, and then I will take feeler gauges which uh, I think we put them back. Anyway, I have sets of feeler gauges, so they're matched. So I can put two of them behind the race here and behind the race here and pretend like I'm putting my shims in on the carrier, but I'm doing it underneath the race just temporarily. And then I get my backlash. I, I get to zero. I don't, I don't fight with the shims trying to do a preload number because I know on pretty much all these Danas from... Uh, you know, this is an 80. Put that in on an 80. If it's a 44, a, a 27, 25, one of those, I'd be down in the 8,000s for my first range. 10 wouldn't scare me. I probably wouldn't go to 15. But just kind of guess for the size how much. Because it, what, it's, what it's really about is how compressive the housing is. Now, thing called a housing separator here. This goes into these holes on the Dana's. Uh, I think there's some of the other axles that use that too, but the Danas are the ones where I've fused it. And that spreads the case out and makes it so you can more easily, when you do have your preload, assemble your carrier into here. The uh, Dana says that the most that you can spread this out without damaging is 15 thousandths. That's a rule they give for all their housings. I put an indicator on this this time because I uh, just wanted to check. 
I was able to spread it eight thousandths before I felt like I was going to strip the spreader out. So you'd be hard pressed to get fifteen thousandths out of this without ruining the spreader, honestly. Um, and then since I had put about twelve thousandths on the bearing set, it, it took a little extra tap to get it in still. And then after I got it in, pulled that out, it's got a reasonable preload. It, it worked out good. We, I was going to leave this open, but we had a extra communication. This is a job and Austin wanted to make sure we did the job. He didn't know I was going to do filming. So you don't get to see that. It's just another differential. No big deal. You've seen them. Okay. Now, again, back to the general idea, just for a second, I described before differences in gears. One that I didn't mention was a worm gear. And in the early days, they used for car rear axles, they used a worm gear, an actual worm down here, a screw with teeth on the outside. And that was where this hypoid came up as kind of an in-between. The man that came up with it, Mr. Ernest Wildhyber, came up with it and he described it as a cross between a uh, spiral bevel gear and a worm gear. And he talked about the, having the good characteristics of both, which I agree with him. He did that in uh, 24, I think was when he was first patenting it. And it wasn't that he patented the gear so much as a method to make it, because it was pretty complex. He worked with Gleason Gear Works, who made most all of the gear machines that made the gears originally, and still today they make machines, last, last I knew anyway. So, and part of that is about, some people uh, have said that this was for the purpose of making sure, you know, dropping this. Well, that was the reason why Packard decided to use it. And that was part of their advertising as to why they decided to use this style of a gear versus a spiral was because of the benefit of dropping the, uh, the hump inside of the vehicle. But that wasn't why the gears were designed this way. That was just the reason they decided to use them for that purpose. They are this way because of strength and smoothness. That's why they're made this way. A worm gear would let them drop the how drop it even further and they already had worm gears and I think even before they were using them these and the worm gears both were used by semi trucks and was mentioned in Ernest's uh, patent again how this could help in a semi truck with getting the pinion higher not lower but higher so that it could come up above the cross members in the frame and give more clearance in that direction on trucks. Anyway, that's sort of ephemeral. Here's some information if you're working on setting up your rear ends. It's hard to find and I wanted to give you a full rundown on what the correct nominal pinion depths were. And normally what they'll do is have a number on here that's plus or minus and that'll be how much you go more or less than the nominal depth for a given housing. I was amazed at even today how many out of all of my going through Mitchell's books that I've got and everything else, so many of them that just mention buy this particular gauge and use this gauge without a real number, just telling you how much it should be off from that gauge. Uh, pinion measuring gauges that I find that you can buy for automotive today, they're supposed to cover all kinds of uh, different applications but they still are not giving you a chart that gives you dimensions. It gives you how far you are off of their dimension with block A or block Z that you put in. So I like numbers. I like numbers that are, are and let's get to that too. Okay, another thing, I, I, as I rattle them through this, remember, to measure these without buying a fancy gauge, you take where the carrier side uh, cups go in. You pull the cups out, carriers out, just cut a piece of straight 4140 turn ground polish that sets across there. Just cut it, knock the burrs off of it. That will give you something good you can measure off of. On top of the pinion, put a one, two, three block on top of there. Then you can put your depth mic on there and measure down to the shaft that goes across. And yes, you have to do the math, but if you understand that, you'll be able to do this with stuff you've already got in your machine shop. Uh, and if you're not a machine shop, um, talk to a machinist, uh, figure out how they do it, get them to help you, or buy a $500 uh, pinion gauge set. Uh, but getting the numbers that I did find, we have got a Dana 80 
And these were right from Dana. Dana gave more information than anybody else. Direct on their website, they have some really good manuals that you can get right from them. And they have three and a half inch for the 80, three and a half inch for the 70, three and one eighth inch, 3.125 for the 60. The 50 is 2.810. The 44 is 2.625. The 30 is 2.250. Now, these ones I got from some miscellaneous people leaving notes about Jeeps, because these are older ones that Dane is not printing anymore. And depending on who you look at, the 25 is either a 2.250 or a 2.343. So you're far enough off, you should figure out for your axle which one it actually is. And that's the same thing for a 23. 23 and 25 were both the same. 27 was 2.094. The 41s were 2.625 or 2.657. Those are close enough. It might not help you, but I would vote for the 625 because Dana seems to be running more nominal dimensions and 657 is not anything I know of as a normal number. Um, 53 is 2.688. The 53-1 or 53-2, those are both supposed to be 2.375. And other than uh, particular weird um, gauges, numbers, and things which didn't give me dimensions, I couldn't find other information for you. Now, let's look at, probably should have brought a knife over. I, can, I think I can peel it up. Okay. There we go. Ah, multiple cut. Okay, we'll use the alternate knife tool. There. So much for the unboxing part of the video. Okay. Here is the carrier side bearing, and the point in looking at that is how you would get underneath here to pull these off. Um, a lot of these have got a little cutout area right in two places, which will let you get in the puller set that I'll show you over there. I know that's the way a 44 is, which was when I first bought the first one of those pullers was for doing a 44 many years ago. And this one here, you might get a bearing separator in there. Uh, you might not. Bearing separator is the piece with the two halves that go together, and then you hook your puller or press on that. But the other type uh, puller that is really good to have when you're working on this stuff is the ones like this, because you just put your jaws underneath the back of that bearing, and it's hard to get off. So you need something that holds those on. Sometimes. You can cheat it. Uh, the best luck I've had with cheating it is with a three jaw and a chain vice grips. Wrap chain vice grips around here and clamp it down. Sometimes that'll work. Um, this works about the best. Sometimes if you're not careful, you destroy your bearing, pulls the cage apart, it sucks. So there's definitely is a reason to have a test set of bearings, but watch out that your test set of bearings is is 99% of the same bearing you're going to put in. And there's probably a few other things that I forgot. I've done about a dozen of those uh, automotive type differentials over the year and probably 50 general gearboxes. But hopefully it gives you a little bit better idea. My thing with the, the hypoids, I'm back here on the automotive scene because we do automotive and because I mentioned automotive and patterning, which is done more in automotive. And I didn't want people to think that I thought patterning was phony. It gives you information. It's a good tool, but you gotta be a little careful with it and you can't just throw a thick glob of grease on there and say it's patterned. It was phony patterning is what I was saying I was not in favor of. And uh, so I wanted to come back against that, but hypoid gears, they're used in industrial stuff. And like I said on the other video, we, I set some up for big, big industrial. They're cool. They work good. Seem a lot on uh, bulldozers too. Rear axle on a bulldozer, you got an old uh, 46A. 
I imagine they're in the new high track drives because that's still a right angle configuration, but I honestly don't know. I haven't been into one of those, but uh, all, all of your old, old cat tractors. Anyway, there we are.